Welcome to Understanding Islam, Standing Before God. This week we're going to look at the rituals associated with birth and death in Islam. Not surprisingly, children are seen as a great blessing within the Muslim community because they are God's way of making a family complete and carrying on the human species. But having a child isn't just a physical act, it's a spiritual act as well, because it's God's way of allowing human beings to share in the creation of a new life. That's why some Muslims will actually perform two raka of prayer before they begin to make love. And some people will actually say, Bismillah, in the name of God. O oh God, keep shaitan, keep Satan away from us and away from the child that might come from our lovemaking. So it's actually part of the spirituality of a Muslim believer. When a mother is pregnant, then there will be not only physical uh, practices that help her to have a healthy child, taking care of what she eats, making sure that she keeps healthy, she gets enough rest and so on. But in some schools of Islam, there are also spiritual practices. There are particular prayers that should be said at certain times during the pregnancy and, as it were, awakening a certain spirituality of the child as in the later stages of pregnancy it grows and develops within you. And indeed, in some schools of Islam, some mothers are taught certain prayers that they are to say during labour itself. Once the child is born and washed and dressed, then the first act that takes place is that either the father or another senior man of the community will whisper into the baby's ear. Into the right ear, they whisper the adhan, the call to prayer, and into the left ear, the ikama, that is, the call which is given when the congregational prayer is about to commence. In this way, one's awakening the Muslim identity of the child, and as it were, pointing forward to the future, this is what lies before you, because remember that every child, when born, is naturally Muslim. That's the way that God created us. After a child has been born, not surprisingly, family and friends come to congratulate the parents, to give a gift for the new child and so on. It's important to remember that this celebration should be equally as strong and fulsome if the child is a girl or a boy. In pre-Islamic Arabia, if they had too many girls in society, they used to practice female infanticide. That means that they would kill certain girl babies. This practice is explicitly forbidden by the Quran. And instead, girls are to be cherished as much as boys, and one is to rely on God's goodness and generosity that one can feed and bring up all one's children. A week after the child is born, there are two ceremonies. One is called Akika, which is the offering of a, an animal for sacrifice as a thanksgiving for the birth of the new child. And the animal is slaughtered, and then a portion of the meat is given to the poor, to the needy, to family, to friends, and a festive meal is enjoyed by everybody concerned. The other thing that happens is that the baby's head is shaved. It is shaved off, all the hair is then weighed against silver, and 
that amount of money is given as an act of charity in thanksgiving for the birth of the child. The next thing to happen is to give the child a name. Now, naming can be quite complex in Muslim society. So first of all, the child will have a given name. For a boy, this given name might be made up from the word abd, meaning the servant of, combined with one of the beautiful names of God. So Abdullah, the servant of God. Abdul Rahman, the servant of the most merciful. For girls, the beautiful names of God are taken and then a derivative is made from them for the name of a girl. So, for example, she might be called Karima from Al-Karim, the most generous. Salma from Al-Salam, the source of peace, and so on. Boys are often called after prophets of an earlier generation. So we find boys who were called Noah or Adam, Abraham, Moses, Jesus. Girls are often called from pious women of an earlier generation. So Mary or Selma, Fatima or Khadija, for example. In the same way, boys can be named after one of the great Muslims of history, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, or Salman, for example. Many boys are given the honorific name Muhammad, but this is often combined with another name, so the boy will be called Muhammad Khalid, for example. So the, the Muhammad just becomes an honorific. Often some of the children are given cultural names that are not necessarily drawn from Islam itself, but rather from the culture from which people come. Children are named also after their father. So if it's a boy, the word Ibn, son of, is used. So, Ahmed ibn Qasim, Ahmed the son of Qasim the father. Or, if it's a girl, Karima bint Ahmed, Karima the daughter of Ahmed. Names have another dimension too, because when someone becomes a parent, Often they are named after their child. So a man who becomes a father might receive the additional name Abu Hassan, the father of Hassan. A woman who has a child might be named after that child. So Um, meaning mother. So Um Hassan would be the mother of Hassan. So in this way, names can increase as life goes on. People can also be named after the trade or profession that they follow. So the famous Al-Halaj, for example, means the wool carder. People can also be named after a famous university where they have studied. So people will get the additional name Al-Azari if they have studied at the University of Al-Azhar. It was part of the special practice of Prophet Abraham to circumcise boy babies. This is carried on into Islam and becomes a customary practice in the Islamic tradition. The end of the foreskin of the penis of a boy is removed. There's no prescribed day or time of life that this should be done. In some cultures it's done when children are small babies, 
Sometimes it's left until they're a few years old. Sometimes it can be left until they're perhaps seven or eight years of age. The general practice seems to be to bring it younger and younger into the first few weeks or months of life. And in developed countries, this is done under sterile conditions, by a doctor, using anaesthetic, and so on. It is a customary practice. It's not an absolute requirement in all schools of Islam if you are an adult convert. But the practice then is that if one is to make the Hajj, which is essentially part of the Abrahamic tradition, then one should be circumcised. One of the consequences of being born is that we are all going to die. It is inevitable. The Quran itself says, every soul shall taste of death. Therefore, death is not something to be feared or something to be fought against, but it is something to which one should be reconciled. As it becomes clear that someone is approaching death, there are various practices which are customary to follow. One of those is that the 36th chapter of the Quran, the Surah Yasin, is recited for the person. This is a Surah that dwells on death and judgment and resurrection so that the person can be thinking of these things as death is approaching. Another practice is that the essential statement of faith of Islam, I bear witness that there is no God but God, Muhammad is the messenger of God, is repeated to the person as death approaches. According to Muslim understanding, after the person has been buried and the grave has been filled in, the mourners depart, the angels come to the person in the grave and they put certain questions to that person. And one of them is, who did you worship? Another, who was your prophet? And so by repeating, there is no God but God, Muhammad is the messenger of God, one is filling the consciousness of the dying person with the answer to these questions that they will soon have to face. Another practice is to turn the person so that they face in the direction of Qibla, the direction of the Kaaba. This is the direction that they faced throughout their life for prayer, and so they should also face in this direction as death approaches so that they can be focused on the resurrection and coming into the presence of God in a way that's not possible during this earthly life. After death has taken place, the body is treated with every respect and courtesy. It must now be prepared for burial. This is to be done by a series of ritual washings and different schools of Islam have different traditions about the number and the order and certain things that are added to the water when this washing takes place. The important thing is that washing is done respecting the dignity of the dead person. So the washers must be of the same sex as the deceased unless it happens to be a marriage partner who can wash their deceased husband or wife. And a sheet is held over the body and the body is washed underneath it to preserve the dignity and respect of the dead person. After the body has been washed, it is then shrouded. Some schools of Islam give particular emphasis if the person is a man and has made the hajj, to shrouding the body using the cloths, the ihram, that was worn for the pilgrimage. But again, the body is shrouded a number of times, varying from one school to another, and in this way prepared for burial. 
the body should not be left alone. And so there will be a system of watchers, people who will stay with the body until the time of the funeral. And it is customary that these people will recite passages of the Quran and they will make certain prayers for the ease of the dead person. There is a degree of haste about burying someone. There is a sense in which the person is not at ease until they are laid in their grave. This means that anything that delays burial is disliked within Muslim communities and to be avoided if possible. So people will dig a grave the very day that somebody has died, if that's possible, or as soon as possible thereafter. There should be no delay. Somebody who dies in the morning can be buried that evening, that afternoon. Somebody who dies one afternoon or evening can be buried the next day. Now, if we live in a developed society where the law of the land requires that under certain circumstances a post-mortem or an autopsy is carried out, Muslims, like the rest of people in society, have no choice but to obey the law. But they would like this to be done with the greatest of dignity and respect and with as little intrusion into the body as possible. In some places it's possible to do this in a non-invasive way using an MRI scanner so that the body does not have to be opened but the cause of death can be found by electronic scanning instead. The customary practice in Islam is that someone should be buried in the place where they die. If one is just a, a little distance away from one's family home, then that is permissible. But the practice of transporting people over a long distance, or internationally flying people, is something which is not encouraged in Islam. Particularly when we think of the length of time involved and health concerns, if a body has to be transported, then that body will have to be embalmed. Many Muslim scholars are not happy with the process of embalming because it interferes with the body and because also some of the substances that are used for embalming can be forbidden substances. So sometimes it happens, but it is not something that many Muslim scholars would want to encourage. The customary practice in Islam is that dead Muslims should be buried. They should be buried in the earth if possible, but in some places in the world where earth burial is difficult, there has been a practice of the use of rock tombs instead. Tombs cut into the rock, which if necessary can even be reused after a number of years. Cremation is not a valid alternative that can be chosen instead of burial, according to Islamic law. That's not to say, of course, that God has a problem if in some way the body is destroyed, if it's lost at sea or eaten by wild animals or is burnt away in a fire. God can cope with these things. However, the preferred practice is by burial in the earth. The grave should be dug in such a way that when the person is laid in and then turned on their right hand side, the face is toward the Qibla. It's in the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca. And in many societies it's customary to build a niche into the bottom of the tomb so that the body can be lowered in and then somebody can actually turn it and roll it into that niche so that it's facing in the correct direction. Sometimes then earth bricks 
or pieces of wood are placed in before the grave is filled in. In traditional societies, the dead body would be kept at home until the time comes for the funeral prayers. That's not always possible in societies in which the burial might be delayed, so some mosques have now built mortuary facilities in which a body can be stored until the time of burial. If it has to be brought from home or from the mortuary place, then there will be a procession to bring it to the place for the funeral prayers. The prayers themselves are called Salat al Janaza. It is a requirement in Islam that some Muslims will bury a dead Muslim. This is one of those obligations which is placed upon the whole community and as long as some people do it, then the obligation is lifted from the whole community. But in practice, large numbers of people will want to come to the funeral to join in the prayers to invoke God's blessings and mercy upon the person who has died. It is not customary to use coffins in Islamic society, although if one lives in a country in which a coffin is required by law, then of course Muslims must comply. So the body will be shrouded and brought in a procession on a bier or a platform that is carried by people and the body will lie on top of it. The body is sometimes brought to the mosque for the funeral prayers. Now, it is not brought inside the mosque prayer hall itself, but rather outside the prayer hall. Now, in some parts of the world that's easy. There will be a courtyard in front of the mosque and the funeral prayer will be conducted in the open air. But in some places where that wouldn't be possible because of climate, then it has been made so that there is a, a place behind the prayer hall where the deceased can be laid and then those who are praying the funeral prayer can stand in the prayer hall itself. The structure of the funeral prayer is the same as any other salah or formal prayer. That is, it consists of Quranic recitations, of short prayers invoking the blessings of God upon the Prophet and his family, and so on, and prayers for the deceased, that God may be merciful in judging them, and so on. However, because the deceased is in front of the congregation, there is to be no bowing or prostration, because one should prostrate to God alone with no one else in the direction of one's prostration. After the prayers are over, then the body will be taken to the place of burial. In some Muslim cultures and societies, it is normal practice for women to come for the funeral prayers, but not to go to the grave. In other cultures, they go to the grave as well, but perhaps stand a little distance away from the grave itself. The body will be brought to the grave. There will be prayers, there will be Quran recitation, the body will be lowered into the grave, correctly positioned, and then the grave will be filled in. And there will be additional prayers and perhaps verses of the Quran as a final farewell to the person. People tend to be slow in leaving the grave. They want to invoke additional prayers upon the person. In fact, in some societies, it's quite common that people will stay in the graveyard all through the first night, reciting verses of the Quran, as it were, keeping the person company in this transition stage, the stage of Barzakh, into which 
they have just entered. Graves are mounded. The earth is raised over them so that people can see here somebody is buried, therefore they can show the appropriate courtesy and respect to that grave. People don't walk over it, they don't sit on it, for example. A grave marker is sometimes erected, and these are normally very simple, just giving the name of the deceased, perhaps sometimes also a verse of the Quran or a short extract. Elaborate grave markers are not favoured within Muslim society, although sometimes it happens, particularly in the case of a person of spiritual excellence, that people want to make the grave a, a fit tribute, a monument to that person who has been buried. It's quite common for people to visit their family graves. They might visit them periodically through the year, the anniversary of the death, for example, the anniversary of their birth. They might visit them on certain festive days so that they are, in a sense, kept alive in the memory of the family through visitations. There is a period of mourning. Islam recognises the necessity of the human being to mourn someone who has died, but this shouldn't be excessive, it shouldn't be prolonged, there shouldn't be great wailing and weeping, but there is a requirement of time for people to come to terms with what has happened. During this period, which might last for a week or so, the family do not cook or entertain, but other people will cook food for the family and for visitors who come to sympathise with them. If a man has died, a married man, then the widow will keep a, an extended period of mourning. This is called Ida, and this will last for four lunar months and ten days. Part of this is to ensure that she is not pregnant. After that period of time, she is free to remarry if she wishes to. If you have missed any of these Understanding Islam programs, they are all available on the Ahlal Bayt TV website, on the On Demand section. And remember that there's an article that goes with each program, and all of those can be downloaded from my own website. Join me next week, when we're going to be looking at Angels, Jinn and the Final Judgment. I look forward to seeing you again then.